So hi everybody, um, I'm Jeremy Bueller. I'm from the Washington Computer Science Department. And um, I want to talk to you about essentially what is it that we tell our own students in our, our edition of the GEP class, Bio 4342, before we turn them loose on uh, annotation projects. So you're all going to be potentially running a class in which you have students doing similar things to what we have our students do. And a lot of them are coming in saying, OK, yeah, I kind of there's this blast thing, and there are all these tools, and I have to make some calls and some inferences, and that's great. But how do you kind of communicate to them what their responsibilities are versus what the software's responsibility is? Do we just assume oh, the software said it? It must be right. <laughs> so how do you, how do you c communicate to them what they need to do to be informed annotators and to give them some idea of what's going on under the hood so you're not just sitting there pushing buttons, you actually understand what models are behind the results that you're getting out. So what I'm going to present to you now is essentially what we tell our students. And so as you're listening to this, you can sort of think about you know, what you want to push um, in your own classes. And then once we go through this discussion, we're going to turn you loose on the first annotation exercise that we give the students, which is just sort of pure, unadorned blast. And you'll see some of the practical frustrations that we hope they're going to hit that turn out to be you know, constructive frustrations to you know, make them understand that maybe these tools don't always have all of the knowledge necessary to make a good decision. And that's why they have to be annotators. OK. So the key things that we want to make sure the students know going in is what is it they're supposed to be doing? What is comparative annotation? They probably have some idea of that, but we want to reinforce that. And very importantly, when they're doing comparative annotation, where does the software's responsibility end and their responsibility begin? So we'll say a little bit about that. Second thing that we want to talk about is all of the work that they're going to be doing is based on some measure of similarity between DNA or protein sequences. Where does that measure come from? Why is it appropriate for what they want to do? What is BLAST actually doing? So we'll take, talk a little bit about that. And then finally, BLAST is going to give them lots of answers. And how do they know which ones are the interesting answers? How does BLAST know which are the interesting answers to show them? So what theory is going into that? So how does BLAST decide when two sequences are similar enough to be worth looking at? So we'll talk a little bit about each of these three things. Yes? Jeremy, I'm really sorry to interrupt. Do you guys have the copies of these slides in your binders under uh, annotations? So if you want to make notes directly on those. Okay. All right. So let's sort of start with the first of these topics here. What is comparative annotation? OK, everybody in here probably knows comparative annotation, but what do we tell the students? Well, you know, we're trying to get them, as you know, to identify functional elements in the sequence. And they're doing this by comparison to databases of sequences of known function. And the students walking into the room would probably be very happy with a story something like the following. Here's a new DNA sequence. And there's something in it that we think might do something. What does it do? So we run and we blast it against you know, GenBank NR or whatever. And we look at all the hits. And say, OK, well, this, is, this has got a good hit to the human cystic fibrosis transmembrane receptor gene, and maybe also to the mouse CFTR gene, and maybe to the dog CFTR gene, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you look at all these things, what conclusion are you probably going to draw? Oh, we're probably looking at something that's a homolog if it's a different species, maybe even an ortholog of CFTR. So this is the kind of inference we make. Oh, yeah, similar functions. You know, all these things with similar functions are hitting here. That must be what the gene does. OK, great. Students probably are pretty comfortable with that. But why are we allowed to do that? Why, why, did, why does that <coughs> inference make sense? It's not a one-step inference process. It's a chain of inferences. And the chain looks something like the following. We're looking for sequences with conserved functions. So you know, trying to identify what the function of a sequence is. And we assume that if the sequence is functional, the function is encoded in the sequence itself. And that means that if the function is to persist over time, changing the sequence would probably mess it up. So these sequences that are functional are going to be under negative selection for the most part. And that means that over time, you're going to see fewer mutations in the functional regions than the non-functional regions. Right? So these things are, in some sense, protected against mutation by you know, natural selection being the ones that we see are the ones that survived. So if we believe, then, that these sequences are under negative selection, the impact of that is if we look at two different lineages, and we're looking at the corresponding sequences in these lineages, 
we should see conservation, right? We should see that most of the bases there are the same as whatever the ancestral base was because they're being preserved against mutation. So that, that, that's conservation. It's a statement about what the evolutionary history of two related sequences is. And then finally, the very last step in that process is if we just look at those two sequences letter by letter and we line them up appropriately, most of the letters are going to be the same. And that's just a statement about comparing a string of characters to a string of characters. That's similarity. Similarity is what we call extensional. It just You can tell by looking at the sequences. Conservation is a statement about what the process was that led to that. So essentially, the chain of reasoning is, that, oh, I'm looking for something functional. Great, it'll be under negative selection. Because it's under negative selection, multiple occurrences of it are conserved. And if they're conserved, they're going to look similar to each other. And what is BLAST good at? BLAST is good at recognizing similarity. That, that's really all BLAST knows how to do, is recognize just similarity. So this is the process that kind of tells us that if we see similarity, maybe there's something interesting going on. But it's really important for the students to realize that this is kind of a priori reasoning. I know I'm looking for this, so I should see this, which would mean I would see this, which would mean I would see this. But of course, what they're actually doing is running BLAST or other tools. And they're going to chain the, change that uh, reasoning chain to go backwards. They're going to do it inductively, not deductively. And that's really important because all you can say is that similarity is evidence of conservation. Conservation, if you can tell it's there, is evidence of negative selection. Negative selection is evidence of a conserved function. But evidence is not proof. And understanding how this chain of evidence can be misleading and go wrong is the first thing that we want our students to understand because it exposes what their responsibilities are as annotators. So let's kind of go through each of these bits one at a time. So how can you have similarity between two sequences when there's no conservation, when, when the sequences did not, in fact, come from a common ancestor at all? Well, my thoughts? So I always get two answers for this, and usually the students give me the one that I'm not looking for, which is also a perfectly good answer. Um, so what, what do you guys think? Yeah? Genetic so genetic drift. So, what, so why does that tend to give you similarity as opposed to divergence? I mean, the random chance of picking these similarities is more likely. It's right. less likely than divergence. Okay, so, so the thing you're getting at is you may have sequences that just by a random mutation tend to end up looking like each other. OK, great. So we can quantify that process. right? So let, let's sort of put some numbers on this. I should have brought my quarter, which I always forget to bring to these talks. But suppose I have my, my virtual quarter here. And I'm going to flip that coin 10 times. What's the chance that it comes up heads 10 times in a row? Assume it's a fair coin. Well, well, no, what's the probability that I get 10 heads? Yeah, but about, what, yeah, about one, a little less than 1 in 1,000, 1 in 2 to the 10th. OK, great. So related question, suppose I flip that coin 10 times, and now I flip it another 10 times. What's the chance that the first sequence of 10 heads or tails matches the second sequence of 10 heads or tails? Really? So, okay, what's the chance that the, 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 the two flips give you the same result? The first flip and the second flip are the same. It's, it, it's a half, right? Because probability one half of heads or tails, probability one half of heads or tails, one quarter both heads, one quarter both tails, therefore the chance that they're the same is a half. So, in fact, the chance that those two sequences come up the same is, again, a little less than one in a thousand. It's, it's the same as ten heads in a row. Well, OK, so with DNA, you don't have two possibilities. You have four. But there is certainly some probability. And if we assume that each of the four bases are equally likely, then it's about one in a million for 10, 10 bases in a row occurring you know, once and then again exactly the same somewhere else. So these are things for short distances that absolutely can happen. right? And we can also tell, based on the reasoning process that led us to that, that the probability that you're going to have a sequence over here that exactly matches a sequence over here just by chance goes down exponentially as the length of the match gets longer and longer. So you know, good news, bad news. Bad news is this actually happens a fair bit because think about it in the genome. How many pairs of places could you fit 10 bases? Well, the length of the sequence times the length of the sequence. So you have a very large number of these pairs. You're going to have a, a high rate of small matches that just occur purely by chance. They're not biologically interesting. On the other hand, 
as you make that match length longer and longer, the number of such opportunities goes down and the chance of it happening goes down. So the point is that you can't absolutely have similarity even though it's not biologically significant and it can happen by chance. But those things are both fairly short and quite predictable. And BLAST has stuff built in, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, to tell when a match is probably consistent with just random chance and throw those away. So BLAST generally does not show you those examples. So we can sort of say, this is really the software's problem. This is not the annotator's problem, because we can you know, get, put a good model on it and throw out most of these before you ever actually have to look at them. Now, there is one other way you can have similarity without conservation. Remember, conservation means these things look the same because they came from a common ancestor. What other biologically significant example of you know, sequences that look the same but don't have a common ancestor do we normally think of, the, assuming the sequences are actually functional? Say so, so again? Yeah. Homo, okay, now I, and I have to remember my phylogeny before I actually say that. Yeah. So, right, so, so homoplasy, if I'm recalling correctly, is again, you see the same sequence in, the, in two places, not because it came from a common ancestor. So that's sort of the whole phenomenon of similarity of that conservation. When that's actually a sign of a functional sequence, though, what, what biological process could lead to that happening? Convergent yeah, convergent evolution, right? So, and we can see that. It's not real likely except in quite short sequences. But for example, regulatory uh, sites, you know, transcription factor binding sites, these are short enough that we think that they arise all the time convergently. So these things can happen for interesting biological reasons. If your students are worrying about annotating genes as opposed to annotating little regulatory sites, they're probably not going to hit this a lot. So in that sense, when we're thinking about gene annotation like the talk we just heard, we can sort of say, yeah, the software is going to mostly catch this stuff for you, about which more a little bit. We can make that statement a little more precise. But most of this is the computer's problem. But let's go on to the next chain in the, um, sorry, the link in the chain of evidence. Can you have conservation without selective pressure? Well, how can that happen? Well, let's take a sort of a motivating example. About how similar overall are the human and chimpanzee genomes? Yeah, 98, 99, depends where you look, but somewhere in that range. Does that mean that the entirety of the human and chimpanzee genomes are under selection? If I take a random chunk of human and chimp from some random place in the genome, let's say I take the two, two homologous locations, they're going to they're be very similar to each other for the most part. Do we think that that means that they're under, under some kind of selection to stay the same? No. So why are they the same, or almost the same? Yeah, they've only been separate for like 8 million years, right? They, they haven't had enough time to diverge. So mutation rates are what determine whether two things that were once the same sequence are still recognizably the same sequence, whether you can see the conservation through similarity. So they're legitimately similar, and they're similar because they came from the same ancestor, they're conserved. But doesn't mean they're under selection. So if things diverged recently, or they diverged not so recently, but the mutation rate happens to be very slow, then you can see conservation. It doesn't mean you should go in there and annotate, oh, I see a gene. I can only do that if I know that the overall rate of uh, mutation is such that conservation generally indicates that it's there for a reason. And this is why it's so important when your students are annotating uh, Drosophila, for example, that they know that the species they're comparing are diverged enough overall that when they see conservation, it's interesting conservation. And you know, so that, that's something that we think about when we say, well, let's annotate this species with reference to Melanogaster. Are they far enough apart? Um, and in general, it's something they need to be thinking about. And there's actually some papers about how you choose organisms at the right di distance to be able to infer that conservation actually means that there's some selection going on. But, Realize the software does not do this for you. The software can recognize similarity. It can sort of rule out random chance. It can't say, yeah, this is really conservation, but it doesn't mean anything. The software has no conception of whether the conservation is meaningful or not. This is the annotator's job. This is your student's job. Your students are going to have to look and say, <coughs> I think that what's there is conserved for a reason. And by pulling in other forms of evidence, some of which we'll talk about today and some tomorrow, 
I think that that conservation indicates that there's a gene there or something interesting going on. So this is really a way to separate the software's responsibility from the student's responsibility. And the student should know that they have responsibilities that the software will not necessarily help them with. Okay? So this is, this is the chain or the portion of the chain where that, that becomes an issue. Now there's one more step in the chain of reasoning which is, okay, suppose that I have similar sequences and it really is evidence of conservation. Let's even, I'll spot you that it's conservation due to negative selection. So these sequences are very similar to each other and they're similar for good functional reason. Does that mean that the sequences have the same function? I mean, that's the last step that, of what we are assuming. Sequences that are similar, conserved under the same selective pressures have the same function. Is that true? I mean, you, you kind of say, oh, yeah, sure, it ought to be true. So this is where you whip out your biochemistry horror stories. Right? So you've got, you got to scare your students so that they have a, you know, healthy, uh, inquisitive skepticism. So the example that I always give the students in 43, 42, now I had to find one that would motivate undergraduates, so it's about beer. Um, so specifically about S. cerevisiae and the uh, core uh, metabolic pathways of S. cerevisiae. So if you look at the enzymes involved in the core metabolism of yeast, there are two genes, ADH1 and ADH2. ADH is alcohol dehydrogenase. And these genes are very, very similar to each other, 90 some high percent similar at the DNA level. You know, BLAST finds them no problem. They're so similar that they tend to cross hybridize if you try to use, use them in microarrays. And they are conserved, they come, they're members of the same gene family, they came from a common ancestor, and they're conserved for good reason. They're under similar selective pressure because they're similarly shaped enzymes, right? The, they, the proteins fold in much the same way. So you might say, well, okay, all of this is true, and they're also both involved in alcohol metabolism, methanol metabolism. So yeah, surely those have the same function, right? Anybody know the difference between ADH1 and ADH2? So alcohol dehydrogenase is a reversible enzyme. And ADH1 and ADH2 are oppositely biased. So that means that, if I'm remembering this correctly, ADH1 shunts glucose out of core metabolism and makes ethanol. And ADH2 pulls ethanol back into the core metabolism to do secondary fermentation and make acetic acid. So even though they're essentially the same protein, or awfully close to the same protein, and even this, essentially the same gene, they have exactly opposite functions because this very small change in the uh, protein is enough to change the bias of the reversible reaction. So the students may hear this and they're like, how am I supposed to know that? <laughs> I only know that because I looked it up, right? So the answer is, you, know, you gotta go ask a biochemist. Why did we have annotation jamborees back in the day when we were first getting genomes annotated? It wasn't because everybody was doing this and we needed to get together in a big group and do this. It was because the people who were doing annotation were the domain experts in particular kinds of gene products. So you needed the person who knows all about alcohol dehydrogenase to say, oh, these two or three key changes to the protein change the bias of the reaction. So this means unless your students are very advanced or willing to do a lot of research, they're not going to detect these sorts of things. They're not necessarily going to be able to make robust statements saying these two things have the same function, I'm sure. Because they're going to have to do a lot of work to find that evidence. This is usually where you would go and consult with somebody with greater expertise. It would be great if we had software that combined all that expertise together could tell you that. We don't really. Um, you can look at comparative annotations to things that are annotated in GenBank, but something like a quarter of those, the annotations were transferred based on sequence similarity and nobody actually did the check here, and so like a quarter of those are wrong. So the answer is the software will do this for you. The students have got to do this. You have to go and really ask somebody or go do a bunch of research to be able to do this. So that really kind of puts an upper limit on what we expect them to tell us when they're doing their annotations, but it also means that when they're saying things, they say, okay, I think that's the uh, CFTR gene if they were doing you know, vertebrates, um, which, which they're not. What they really want to say is, you know, this appears to be 
you know, conservative appears to be homologous to this known gene. Um, it's got all the evidence that it's still a functional gene and maybe is even under the same selective pressure. I might hypothesize that it's got the same function, but I'm not sure. Right? And so we, we value uncertainty and statements of uncertainty in those annotation reports as much as we value the evidence and certainty that they were able to establish. So that kind of calibrates, I think, the expectations that we have for the students. And it's a good thing to remember this sort of tripartite division when they're asking you, what should I be doing? Okay. So questions about this? Yeah. So obviously, you need to follow up that one up with uh, functional studies. You need to look at uh, where these two homologs or ontologs expressed, right? Right. RNA expression, um, and then you can mutate those genes to see the functional compensation. Right. So you, you could look at yeah. you know, whether there's divergence, and this one's only in this tissue, and this one's only in that yeah. tissue, um, or this developmental stage and that developmental stage, or this one's truncated and this one's not truncated. There are lots of things you can do to establish whether the thing is still functional at all. And if there are obvious differences in function or timing or location of expression, still, and those are all great things to know if you've got the resources to discover it. Um, so anything you can establish positively would be great if the students can annotate that. But it depends on how much time you've allocated for the work and how many resources they feel comfortable using. Okay. All right, so let's dive into the next section. So once they kind of know what they're doing, Fundamentally, what they're doing is they're running BLAST a lot and BLAST-like tools. And they're relying on BLAST output to give them some clue as to where to look and what the interesting parts of their sequences are. So why do we think BLAST is doing the right thing? Let's kind of think about that a little bit. Well, BLAST's job is fundamentally to measure the similarity of two DNA sequences. How should we do that? You know, first principles. How do we say how similar are two sequences? Well, we can say, sure, they're exactly the same. DNA sequences of interest are never exactly the same. Mutation happens. So if they're not exactly the same, what's more similar and what's less similar? Well, they kind of have more letters in common, OK. But how do you line them up? Because you can have bases get inserted or deleted as well as substituted. So What's the right way to measure similarity under those circumstances? If you have computer science training, maybe you're familiar with things like regular expressions in Perl or Python. That's a way of measuring approximate similarity. That you describe a pattern, and the sequence matches that pattern, which may include some variability. So you know, if I, is that a basis for a measure of biological similarity? Uh, it's not clear. So, Whatever measure we use, whatever measure BLAST uses, should reflect our desired evolutionary inference. We're trying to infer that similarity implies some kind of homology, some kind of conservation. So how does BLAST's measure of similarity get at this question of, are the sequences conserved? Because that basically determines why it does what it does, subject to whatever limitations the people who wrote the software had to deal with. So first of all, in order to talk about similarity when mutation can happen, you need a model of what mutations are possible. And BLAST is really dumb. BLAST only does what it was programmed to do in terms of understanding mutations. Now, there's all kinds of mutations out there. There are um, you know, inversions. There are segmental duplications. There's all kinds of wacky stuff. BLAST does not understand any of that. To a first approximation, as far as BLAST is concerned, Mutations come in only three forms. You can change a base in a sequence to another base. You can add a base. And you can delete a base. And this is almost true for BLAST. All pairs of sequences that you might say are similar must have diverged only by the accumulation of these three kinds of mutation. So if you're dealing with a system where the primary model of um, you know, how these things mutate, like for example, bacterial genomes, is big segmental inversions, BLAST doesn't understand that. Use a different tool. But if you're doing something like comparing sequences where mostly the divergence has been localized insertion, deletion, and substitution, BLAST understands that. And this is the model that it uses. So given that this is what we think is happening in sequences to cause them to diverge, how would you measure how similar two sequences are to each other? 
Well, suppose that we have some sequences, let's call them S and T, and they diverge from a common ancestral sequence, let's call it U. So here's an example of some very small sequences with that property. We'll say AGAGT here, on one lineage evolved into ACAGT and the other evolved into AGAT. Okay. So how did that happen? Well, let's look at these sequences and you know, here, I'll tell you, this is what happened. We're going to draw lines between bases of S and T that came from the same ancestor, and I'll tell you which base of the ancestor it came from and what happened. So this A and this A both <coughs> evolved from this A. So we say these are the homologous bases. They match whatever was in the ancestor. This A and this A similarly. This T and this T similarly. Now, this C and this G both came from this ancestral G. On this lineage, there was a substitution. Okay, so this C and G are formally homologous. However, this G came from this G. On the other branch, this G was lost. And so there is no homologous base to this G. If I were to line these up properly, I'd have to leave a gap here to have the bases correspond. So this kind of alignment of two sequences against their common ancestor is a tree alignment. And what we would actually do in practice is we would elide this middle sequence, this ancestral sequence, and just trace these lines between pairs of, of the modern sequences. So the A matched the A, the C matched the G, the A matched the A, the G didn't match anything, the T matched the T. What we get is a correspondence between the bases of S and T. This is our sequence alignment. And this is what BLAST will actually show you. And given that we know the sequence alignment, it's actually pretty trivial to measure similarity. The simplest thing is simply to say, which bases stayed the same? What fraction of them stayed the same? In this case, it was three out of five positions stayed the same. So we'd say this pair is, say, 60% identical. We could get a little bit fancier. We could assign a bonus everywhere that there's a match and a penalty everywhere there's a mismatch and maybe a bigger penalty everywhere that a base got inserted or deleted. And we would add up the scores. That's actually what BLAST is doing. Um, but fundamentally, once you got the alignment, the scoring is the easy part. So fewer mutations mean more conservation. If we give bonuses to matches, penalties to everything else, then the high, higher scores mean essentially more conservation better evidence of conservation, if you like. Okay, So I won't go into the theory of how you derive these scoring functions, um, like things like PAM and Blossom for protein, DNA PAM for DNA. But fundamentally, you're simply doing fancy weighted measures of number of conserved bases. Okay, So this seems pretty easy, right? So where's the problem here? So let's see. Somehow I got to assume that I knew the ancestral sequence as well as the mod, uh, modern sequences, and I knew the history. How did we do that? Well, I guess we went and found some ancestral sequences, right? We found the mosquito preserved in amber, right? And, and we got the blood out, and we sequenced it. We got the dinosaur DNA. And you know, it was kind of <coughs> decomposed a little bit, so we filled it in with the frog DNA. You know where this is going, right? <laughs> Dinosaurs eating people! <laughs> This is not a basis for sound scientific inquiry. <laughs> so what is BLAST actually doing? Right? BLAST doesn't have that ancestral sequence most of the time. It doesn't have, even if it had the ancestral sequence, because hey, maybe we're doing Neanderthal. Like if I'm going to actually get DNA for that, um, or mammoths or something, we don't have the exact knowledge of where the mutations occurred. It's ambiguous. So how is it that BLAST is giving you this measure of similarity? How does it dare give you that measure of similarity? It doesn't know. We don't know. Well, OK, fine. Since we don't know, we're, it's clearly making its best guess. So what is the definition of a best guess here? So to motivate this, what I usually show the students is, here's two sequences, A, G, C, C, A, T, C, C. Here are two possible alignments of those sequences, the top one and the bottom one. Now, as far as we know a priori, we have no idea which of these is correct. Which one do you like better? Students usually have one they like better. Which one do you guys like better? Uh, bottom one. Why? Yeah, so how many mutations, remembering that every change in a base or insertion and deletion of a base is one mutation, how many mutations are necessary to explain what happened here? Well, remember, these are single bases. It happens one base at a time. Right, so 10, right? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
one, two, three, four, five. These, bit, these two sequences are assumed not to be homologous at all because they didn't have a common ancestor or we would have aligned them to each other. Whereas this hypothesis says, no, actually these are homologous and it only takes one mutation to explain why they're not the same. So fewer mutations are necessary to support this hypothesis and support this hypothesis. If we think mutations are unlikely events, we like this hypothesis better. What is this an example of? Parsimony, Parsimony also known as Occam's razor. Do not multiply entities without necessity. Don't mu multiply mutations without necessity. So fundamentally, what BLAST is actually doing is it's considering all possible ways of aligning the two sequences. It's thinking about this and this and everything in between and picking the one that requires the fewest mutations, or if it's got a weighted scoring system, as we talked about here, the least total weight of mutations. It essentially considers the alignment that maximizes the score among all possible alignments. Now, there's super exponentially many possible alignments on the length of the sequences, so your students may say, well, how do you even do that? You need computational biologists for something, right? <laughs> so the answer is the Smith-Waterman algorithm and many fancy things on top of that. And you know, if your students want some extra credit, by all means, go make them learn that, because I like to teach it in my classes. Um, but fundamentally, if you, it's not important to know exactly how it considers all possibilities. What's important to know is it does consider all possibilities and take the one that's most parsimonious in terms of an explanation. So that's what BLAST is doing. It's making a parsimonious guess based on a certain model of mutation that um, contributes to how it would score a given alignment between sequences, and it's trying to maximize that, that measure. OK? Yes? That might seem computationally intense, because it has to go through every iteration of comparison, and it's trying to generate So it doesn't actually enumerate all the alignments. It, there are dynamic programming algorithms that mean you don't have to do that. They're still pretty expensive. Um, and BLAST actually has many heuristics in it to avoid having to run that algorithm as much as possible unless it's got a really good reason to believe that, it, that doing that comparison might give a good score. So even with all the heuristics built into BLAST, it's still a computationally intensive thing. So it's computationally intensive because it has a lot to do and because the databases are so big, um, even though people have worked for decades on how to make those algorithms run faster. It's actually something that I've done some of my own research on. So yeah, it's expensive. And we could, I'd be happy to talk about that at some point if people want to listen. I actually teach a class in this about every other year. OK. Other? All right. So again, to summarize, the students hopefully have some idea of you know, BLAST actually is motivated by a certain model with a certain limited idea of what mutations are. And that's where the scores come from. The scores are not magic. But the scores are related to a model of conservation. OK, so last point then. BLAST doesn't show you every possible alignment. And BLAST does not tell you a score for every possible pair of sequences. So how does it decide what to show you and what not to show you? This is a pretty important question. Because for any two sequences, I could put them into the comparison measure that BLAST uses. And I'll get a number out. There is some most parsimonious alignment of those sequences. So if I look at GenBank and R, it's got you know, 10, 20, 30 million sequences. That's probably too small. I haven't looked that recently. And I take some query sequence, and I check it against every sequence in GenBank and R, I'm going to get 10, 20, 30 million answers. When you run BLAST, you don't generally get 30 million answers. So how does BLAST decide what to show you? Well, it shows you the ones with the best score. All right. But if higher scores are better, how high is high enough? Should I show you the best score? Well, I could have more than one homologous sequence in my database. Should I show you the best three scores? Why three? Should I show you the best 10 scores? Should I show you every score above some threshold? And if so, what threshold? How do you make that decision in a principled way? When is a score high enough to be evidence of conservation? Now, I have to say, this is a really fundamental question. And to kind of give you some evidence for why it's fundamental, BLAST, as we know it today, came out in about oh, 1990. I think that's when the software was first released. 
We knew how to do the fundamental algorithms in BLAST for a long time before that. The Smith-Waterman algorithm that I mentioned for doing that comparison was invented essentially in, I think, 1969. Um, and there were tools like FASTA that were doing this sort of comparison all through the 1980s, if not indeed before. So why did BLAST only come out in 1990? It wasn't because we figured out how to do the algorithms fast enough. It's because the theory of how to set the right threshold for compelling evidence of conservation was not published until 1989. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that theory is now. Okay? That theory is Carl and Altschul theory, by the way. So here's the general idea of how you decide what threshold is the right threshold. We're going to try to reject a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the sequences are unrelated to each other. So let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that we had two sequences that were, in fact, totally unrelated. I could align those two sequences using BLAST, and I could find a most parsimonious alignment. It would have some score. So given that I know the two sequences are unrelated, what is the distribution of the score that I would get? It's not clear what the functional form of that distribution is. You know, if I plotted it, what would it look like? for random you know, pairs of, or just pairs of unrelated sequences. I can find probably lots of pairs of unrelated sequences out there. So if I knew what that distribution was, then I could say, given the sequences are unrelated, the probability that their score is going to be at least some theta maybe is at least 0.05, or sorry, is at most 0.05, or 0.001, or 1 times 10 to the minus 10th or something. And I could set a threshold for that p-value, right? And if I got a score that is really unlikely to occur by chance under this null model, then okay, maybe that's what I should show you and everything else I should throw away. So I want to robustly reject the null hypothesis that the sequences are unrelated. So to do that, I need a model of what the score distribution should look like for pairs of unrelated sequences. Yeah. What do unrelated sequences look like? Well, that, that's really nonspecific. I'm asking you, here's what the sequences aren't. What should the score distribution look like? That's really hard to say. I mean, are they AT rich? Are they GC rich? Are they repetitive? Are they not repetitive? Uh, you know, what are the Markov properties of the sequences? I have no idea. I don't really have enough information to tell you this distribution. So is this a valid way to approach significance of scores if I don't know what the distribution should be. Well, what do I do? I need to restrict my null hypothesis to something maybe a little weaker than they're unrelated, but something that I can actually quantify the distribution and therefore actually reject that null hypothesis. So that's what we're going to do. In particular, we're going to use the so-called IID random model of sequences. So here's a way of getting pairs of sequences, and I'm pretty sure everybody in this room is going to agree that if I come up with two sequences in this way, they have nothing to do with each other. And it'll be a model that I can actually compute the uh, score distribution in. So here's the model. I'm going to generate sequence S by the following random process. I'm going to get out my four-sided die. Who here has used tetrahedral dice? Any D&D enthusiasts? Got a couple. OK, good. So we're going to have our, our tetrahedral die. And it doesn't have to be a fair die, right? Because in general, we have bias-based compositions. But we're going to use that die, and we're going to roll it, and we're going to get an ACG or T. And that's going to be the first base of sequence S. And then we're going to roll it again. That's going to be the next base of sequence S. And we're going to keep doing that until we have sequence S all done, for as many bases as you want it to be. And then we're going to start generating sequence T, and we're going to do it by the same process, independent rolls of the dice. Okay. Now, because each roll of the die is independent, what I get here and what I get here are unrelated to each other. It's equally likely, given this, that this is going to be A, C, G, or T, if it's, a, if it's an unbiased die. Or even if it's biased, the distribution of bases here has nothing to do with what I saw here. But more importantly, the distribution of bases in any position here is totally independent of the distribution of bases at each of these positions, right? So these sequences are definitely unrelated because they were generated by two independent random processes, right? OK, so these guys are definitely unrelated. And more to the point, it's a constructive model, so I can tell you the probability in this model of seeing any particular sequence. If it's a fair die, then the chance of seeing any given sequence of length L is 1 in 4 to the L. 
For biased models, it's a little more complicated, but not much. So given that model, I still have the same question. Given sequences S and T that were generated in this way, if I compare them to each other and get the most parsimonious alignment, what's the score distribution? Well, it's a constructive model, so I could actually generate that distribution empirically. I could generate lots and lots of pairs of random sequences by this model. And for each one, I could feed it to BLAST and say, give me the best score. And I could plot the distribution that comes out. And that would give me a basis for computing p-values. Now, what that distribution is is going to depend on the lengths of S and T. The longer the sequence is, the higher the score is going to be, just by chance. And it's going to depend on the base distributions. But if I knew those things, then I could get the score distribution. And if I took two real sequences, I could say, Suppose I generated random sequences with the same lengths and same base distributions as these real sequences, as, but assume that they were unrelated, what would the score distribution be? If my real sequences score better than that, maybe I should report them. And if they don't, then I shouldn't. So at least that's a basis for writing some software, right? So the only problem is, what is that distribution? I still haven't told you anything about the functional form of the distribution. And it just it wasn't known for a long time. I think this was figured out in about 1987 by two guys, Carlin and Altschul. Um, Stephen Altschul is, to the best of my knowledge, still at um, the National Institutes of Health. His son is actually a WashU student, um, so we know. In the computer science department, Will Altschul. Um, but the point is, we do actually, you know, Pressure for me, right? So, yeah. so anyway, the point is, we do actually know the shape of this distribution. It's an extreme value distribution. And Colin and Altschul worked out um, how to compute that distribution, the parameters of that distribution, for certain special cases in about 1987, 88, 89. And that was what was published. Um, around about 1996, it was extended to the case of uh, alignments with insertion and deletion, which the original paper was not. Um, and this is what's built into BLAST for getting scores. This is Carl and Altschul theory. So essentially, we can know what that score <coughs> distribution is, and therefore we can set appropriate cutoffs for any given p-value to decide how similar is similar enough to report. Now, okay, one, one more little subtlety, just a short one. There is such a thing as multiple test correction. Um, we're not doing one comparison of two sequences in BLAST. We're typically comparing your query sequence to an entire database of millions and millions of other sequences. So you have many chances for a good enough match for any given threshold, just by chance. So we need to account for that multiple test correction. How do we do that? What BLAST reports is not p-values. BLAST reports so-called e-values. And the e-value for a given threshold theta is the expected number of times in the comparison that you're actually doing that you would by chance see an alignment whose score is at least theta. So if I have a million chances to generate such an alignment, then if my chance of doing it for any one pair of sequences is maybe 1 in 10 to the fifth, 10 to, you know, 1 in 10 to the fifth, so 10 to the minus fifth, then if I have a million independent trials, then on average about 10 times I'm going to get something that good, right? So the point is we need to actually correct for this. And so e-values, ideally, for your alignment should be less than 1. Because if an e-value is 1, that means that if I got one good result out of my search, well, that's about what I expected for whatever my threshold theta is. E-values less than 1 mean that in this, a search of the size I did, I'm going to have fewer results on average than 1. And if my e-value is a lot less than 1, then I'm, it's going to be very rare that I'm going to have a result that good. Because an e-value, for example, of 0.1 means if I repeated this experiment 10 times with randomly chosen sequences each time, only once in those 10 times would I typically see a score as good as the score that I'm looking at right now, theta. And so your e-values, as you get smaller and smaller, you get more and more excited. And if your e-value is you know, 10 to the minus 100th, which does happen in BLAST for really good alignments, that means I'd have to do this experiment 10 to the 100th times to see something that good. Now you're pretty excited because, OK, this is probably not a case of unrelated sequences. Now, does it mean that it's a case where your sequences are functionally related to each other? We just talked about that. No. It just means that you have similarity that allows you to fairly robustly reject the null hypothesis of totally unrelated sequences. 
Are there alternative hypotheses that are not these sequences are actually homologous that you might have to consider? Thoughts? How could you have two sequences maybe score very well when you align them and not be homologous over, you know, it's a, a significant length. Okay, so isoforms, that's generally a case where you're going to see homology, although it may be interrupted. So I would claim that that's probably evidence of actual homology. I'm asking if there's no homology at all. Could you still have something that has a much better than expected score given this null model? I'm thinking about gene mutations, because they would share a homologous ancestor, but... Right, so I would claim that's still evidence of homology. So yeah, short sequence. Okay, so short sequences, as we established very early on, can just by chance look similar to each other. Um, now the the problem is, ideally, this null model should be catching those. So how can the null model fail to catch them? Is the question. What what does the null model assume? It assumes, for example, that the sequences are independent, identically distributed in each sequence's base distribution. So you assumed a particular distribution of bases. BLAST assumes by default for at least one of those two sequences, I think for the query sequence, that its bases are uniformly distributed. If you give me a very AT-rich query sequence, then that's not going to match the model that was used to generate the, the distribution of uh, scores. So typically, any deviation from that model is going to result in E values that are smaller than they really should be because you're rejecting a null hypothesis that's the wrong null hypothesis. So essentially, you have to be very careful to say, well, okay, just because the E value is a little less than one, don't get too excited, because maybe the model is not quite the right model, and there's an equally good explanation for this. If your E value is 10 to the minus 10th, then maybe you're, you're a little more excited about it. But we tend to tell our students, because real sequences are not identically distributed, in every position, think about isochores in the genome. You have AT-rich regions and GC-rich regions. And each base is really not always independent of its neighbor. Think about um, CPG islands. The frequency of C followed by G in um, certainly the human genome and many others is much lower than you would expect given the frequency of C and the frequency of G in isolation because CPGs tend to get selected against in methylated regions. So that model is actually wrong. And because of that, the E values tend to be a little optimistic. So what we usually tell students is be very skeptical of a quote unquote match with an E value greater than about, oh, I'm going to say 10 to the minus fifth, maybe as high as 10 to the minus third if you're feeling good that day. But in general, be worried if you're getting an E value that's not that much below one. Now, I say this, but if you go in and you use BLAST in the default mode for uh, protein, for example, anybody know what the default E-value threshold is for uh, BLAST-P when you're comparing a sequence to a protein, a protein database? The default E-value threshold for BLAST-P is 10. Does that make sense? Well, so an E value of 10 means I expect to see about 10 matches in, in my comparison that, that are that good. Why, why would BLAST do that? Thoughts? Hmm. I think of a good reason. Uh, okay, think about social reasons more than scientific reasons. If you are. Um, a biologist trying to you know, understand what a novel protein is, and missing the only homology you can find means you don't get to publish your paper and you don't get tenure. Would you rather have that E-value be higher or lower? <laughs> you probably want to set that threshold really high and just eat the cost of doing you know, the manual inspection of all the results. That made a lot of sense in the 1970s and 1980s when GenBank was much smaller. I claim this is a historical artifact of that time. Nowadays, because the databases are so much larger, you cannot afford to have an E-value threshold that high for a large database. So it's sort of predicated on the assumption that you're not going to get very many hits. Um, 
for your students doing annotation projects in your class, I would strongly suggest being more aggressive about setting those e-value thresholds. It will save them time. It will save you time. You will still get interesting results. And you'll still have plenty of interesting annotation to do. But you know, realize that the defaults in BLAST may not be the thing you want to use. OK? Yes? And remember that BLAST oh, is ahead. only reporting the first 100 um, sequences by default in the web industry. Yeah. Um, so that's the way that they filter the uh, results. Question? So aren't e values destined, though, be, to become worse and worse over time? Because they scale not only according to the size of your query, which you can control, but the size of the database, which just grows and grows and grows. Yes, actually, you're right. Multiple test correction gets worse the more tests you have. So the more, the bigger the database you search, the worse your e values are going to be. If you know something a priori, that means that I'm only going to look at prokaryotic genomes and not eukaryotic genomes. You should do that because starting with a smaller set means that anything you find is going to be more significant. So yes, absolutely. Um, you know, the more times you try, the better the chance you might find a good result just by chance. Yeah, statistics kind of sucks. <laughs> but that 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 is absolutely correct observation. So, all right. So then just to summarize what we've been doing so far, what do the students need to know before you turn them loose on annotation? They need to know what they're doing, why are they doing comparative annotation, what's the reasoning behind it, and what does that imply about what their responsibilities are versus what the software is doing versus what they have to go ask somebody else about. They need to know when they're getting scores out of BLAST, what do those scores mean, and why are they um, why are they even possible to compute because of things like parsimony? And what mutation model is underlying that? And the fact that they're not seeing a result for every pair of sequences means that BLAST is doing some filtering for them. And what is the basis of that filtering? And what is an e-value anyway? And why do we use e-values, not raw scores, to establish whether something looks interesting? So the, the things that we just talked about. So with that knowledge in our edition of the class, we then turn the students loose on their very first annotation prod project. And that's exactly what we're going to do for you all right now. We are going to turn you loose on uh, what we call homework one. This is um, what's in your packet, I believe, after the lecture notes. And it's going to be, you know, we're going to drop some sequences on you, and we're going to say, what do you think is in here? And the only evidence you're going to have is essentially BLAST and one other BLAST-like thing, which is repeat master. And what I want you to do is over the next two, let's see what time is it, next hour or so, you're going to work through that exercise. And I'm going to sort of check in with you at various points. And we're going to stop and reflect on what kind of evidence we're getting out of the tool. And where does the theory here actually hit the weird stuff you see when you actually run BLAST? 